Welcome to our video about phosphorylation of pre-initiation complexes on behalf of MCDB 427 at the University of Michigan. Today we will be focusing on Figure 11.18 from the textbook Molecular Biology by Robert Weaver. RNA polymerase II has 12 subunits named RPB1 through 12 in order of size, and to learn more about the structure of RNA polymerase II, you can watch our other video. We are going to simplify the drawing of RNA polymerase II here. Remember that all 12 subunits are present throughout the processes described. This tail is only the CTD region of RPB1 subunit, and we will be looking at the effect of its phosphorylation. However, every one of the subunits contains a C-terminal and an N-terminal domain. We just won't be focusing on those in this video. Because RPB1 contains the only CTD that is phosphorylated in RNA polymerase II, we often call the unphosphorylated form RNA polymerase IIA, and when the CTD of RPB1 is phosphorylated, we refer to it as RNA polymerase 2O form. The 2O form contains many phosphorylated serines, threonines, and tyrosines in the carboxyl terminal domain of the largest subunit RPB1. There are many repeated heptads throughout the CTD region, and the phosphorylation pattern can vary between them meaning the amino acids that are phosphorylated are not always the same. For the sake of simplicity, in this example, we are only going to show two phosphorylations on the CTD region to represent the 2O form of RNA polymerase II. However, the many heptads and the phosphorylation states of their respective amino acids is not shown. 2A is responsible for initiation of transcription, and 2O, the phosphorylated form, is responsible for RNA chain elongation. This indicates that phosphorylation of the complex occurs sometime between forming the initiation complex and promoter clearance. We can understand from this that the phosphorylation is what allows RNA polymerase II to switch from initiation to elongation. This idea is confirmed by the knowledge that the unphosphorylated RPB1 CTD region of 2A binds much tighter to Tata binding protein, TBP, than the phosphorylated RPB1 CTD region of 2O. Phosphorylating the RPB1 CTD region weakens the connection between RNA polymerase II to TBP and allows transcription elongation to occur. There are some exceptions to the rule, however, since sometimes transcription can occur in vitro without phosphorylation of the CTD. Before we talk about how this phosphorylation occurs, we should talk about the general transcription factors that assemble into the initiation complex. Transcription factors are responsible for interacting with the DNA at the promoter and recruit the rest of the initiation complex in order to begin transcription. The class II pre-initiation complex contains polymerase II and six general transcription factors. These are named TF2D, TF2A, TF2B, TF2E, TF2F, and TF2H. The data for how researchers identified the binding order of these transcription factors can be seen in figure 11.1. .1. However, since it is not the focus of this video, we will just tell you the conclusions from their gel mobility shift assay. The order of assembly is as follows. 2D binds the promoter region with or without 2A, then 2B joins. 2F binds next as a complex with RNA polymerase II. 2E binds the RPB1 subunit of RNA polymerase, and 2H binds last. In order to determine which part of the initiation complex was responsible for catalyzing the phosphorylation of the CTD region, Reinberg and his team performed another gel mobility shift assay. For this experiment, they used a 3' end radio-labeled DNA fragment, which contained a promoter region. After allowing initiation factors to bind, the researchers used autoradiography to see where the DNA fragment ran through the gel along with the binding factors. Remember, in a gel mobility shift assay, the more proteins that are bound to DNA, the slower it will move through the gel. Looking at the labels of this figure, we can see that the researchers added different components of the complex piece by piece and compared their mobility with or without ATP being added. If the mobility of the complex was changed upon addition of ATP, it would be a good indicator that the last protein added was responsible for phosphorylating the CTD region of RPB1. You can see which transcription factors the researchers added along the top line here. They first added a complex of TF2D, 2A, and 2B, abbreviated as DAB, followed by TF2F, TF2E, and TF2H added one at a time to build up the initiation complex. 
to keep track of which transcription factors are being added and what the outcome of each one was, we've listed all of them here. Starting with lanes 1 and 2, we can see that DAV, which is TF2D, TF2A, and TF2B, were added with or without ATP. It isn't surprising that these products are moving at the same speed through the gel regardless of ATP, though. Without polymerase being added, there is nothing to be phosphorylated, and therefore we cannot conclude anything yet about the status of these factors as a kinase for RPB1. Next, researchers added additional components to the complex. Lanes 3 and 4 show the addition of TF2F and RNA polymerase 2A. Remember that they are adding 2A here because they are trying to look at what is doing the phosphorylation. If they had added RNA polymerase 2O, the phosphorylated form, they would not be able to see a mobility shift upon addition of ATP, even if the phosphorylating protein was present. Again, we do not see a difference in mobility when comparing these two lanes. Here, we can conclude that TF2F is likely not responsible for this conversion between forms of RNA polymerase 2. And, since 2D, 2A, and 2B are added as well, we can similarly eliminate these transcription factors as most likely not kinases. We can only say at this point that these are likely not the kinase because it's possible that they do have the capacity to phosphorylate, but at this point are inactive. It's worth noting that the complex in lanes 3 and 4 is clearly moving slower than the complex in lanes 1 and 2. This is because the additional factors such as RNA polymerase 2 are slowing down the movement through the gel. Keep in mind that we are comparing the mobility between the same factors upon addition of ATP in order to identify when phosphorylation occurs, which could direct us to which factor contains a kinase. Lanes 5 and 6 show the addition of TF2E, and since there is, again, no difference in mobility upon addition of ATP, we can conclude that TF2E is also most likely not the kinase. In lane 6, you may have noticed that it looks like the band is moving slightly slower without ATP. However, this is probably just due to a problem in the way the gel was running, and not due to a true difference in mobility. Since the difference between the bands is subtle, and the authors indicate them both as the same length corresponding to DAB, FE, Paul 2A, we conclude that the mobility between the two is the same. As we look at the labels on the left of this gel, we see that with each component being added, they are running slightly higher on the gel as the complex grows. To reiterate, we are not comparing the rate of migration between different complexes. Rather, we are looking at the migration of the same complex with or without ATP. Finally, in lanes 7 and 8, we see that the addition of TF2H forms the complex DABFEH-POL2A. Here, we do see that the addition of ATP changed the complex to a lower mobility. The researchers show that the mobility slowed such that it was clearly no longer composed of RNA polymerase 2A, but instead 2O. Because TF2H converted POL2A to 2O in the presence of ATP, we can say that it was probably the kinase that performed the phosphorylation. While we know this to be true from further experiments, the data from this gel alone don't prove this entirely. It's possible from here that the kinase is in some other factor and was activated once the entire complex, or just TF2H, was added. As we know, though, the kinase was indeed one of the proteins that make up TF2H. We hope you've enjoyed watching this video, and as always, go blue!